Welcome back to Polygamy, An Enemy Has Done This. In this series, I'm attempting to persuade my fellow Latter-day Saints that our own scriptures make the case that polygamy cannot be found within the doctrine of Jesus Christ, and that we can have faith that women are fully equal to men in God's plan. I've talked about why it's important for us as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to figure this out, and we began a chronological review of the scriptures as they relate to marriage and polygamy starting with the creation template, which provides at least two independent witnesses that define God's law of marriage. We've done a thorough scriptural breakdown of who started polygamy, how, and for what purpose it was instituted, and we've seen why secret combinations are always associated with it. We examined Enoch's teachings and the city of Enoch for polygamy and found none. We examined Noah's day and found it abundantly. Scriptures testify that the radical variation of marriage that is polygyny has popped up on the earth and among God's people in every dispensation. But that alone does not tell us whether it is of God or of Satan. Polygyny's pervasiveness only tells us that it's extremely important to one of them. Polygyny is either important to God because it is celestial marriage, or it's important to Satan because it destroys celestial marriage. As Latter-day Saints, we've told ourselves a lot of stories about polygamy. And since 1852, when the polygamy document that decades later became Doctrine and Covenant, Section 132, was revealed to the saints in Utah, our stories have universally been from the perspective that polygamy comes from God. And biblical polygamy has been the well from which we've primarily drawn that water. In this episode and the next ones on biblical polygamy, I'm going to tell the stories of the patriarchs and prophets and kings as if polygamy is a tear sown by Satan, which I believe it is. Now, if this is the first episode of this series that you're watching and you're wondering how I can say that polygamy comes from Satan when our very own scriptures say that God allows for it in cer certain circumstances, I'm saying that the polygamy document, which the law of many wives and concubines hangs on, needs to demonstrate that it is, in fact, the Word of God. If it is the Word of God, it should align with all of God's revealed Word, rather than flip God's Word on its head. So in this series, I am continuously trying this polygamy document against God's Word, as found in the Pearl of Great Price, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and the Doctrine and Covenants that were accepted by common consent as the law and scriptural canon of the Church for the first 50 years of the Restoration. Looking closely at, bi at biblical polygamy is really important because despite having so much additional scripture given through the prophet Joseph Smith, when we try to understand the doctrine of many wives and concubines, the only real defense we have for it is found in the Bible. There's nothing in these other scriptures to support polygamy, unless you want to twist one verse of Jacob's sermon to flip his entire message on its head. At the beginning of this series, I mentioned that my goal is to persuade you to have faith that polygamy is not of God. And I acknowledge that I won't be able to prove polygamy is a sin. This is because of the biblical record. Biblical polygamy cannot be proved sinful by the Bible alone. And our stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the ones that we cling to most tightly as we reassure ourselves that our narrative is correct. But remember that slavery cannot be proved sinful by the Bible alone either. It always occurred concurrently to polygamy and was bound by the same framework of laws. The two systems go hand in hand because they both rely on some humans having authority and ownership over others. One thing that I'll help you keep in mind on the next few episodes on biblical polygamy is a critical teaching in the Book of Mormon found in 2 Nephi. It's where the prophecy of Joseph of Egypt is included. Joseph spoke of two books, one written by his descendants, which is the Book of Mormon, and the other by Judah's descendants, which is the Bible. And Joseph prophesied that these two books shall grow together under the confounding of false doctrines and laying down of contentions and establishing peace among the fruit of thy loins and bringing them to the knowledge of their fathers in the latter days and also to the knowledge of my covenants, saith the Lord. So while the Bible alone cannot be used to prove that polygamy is an abomination always, Adding the light and knowledge from the Book of Mormon can and will confound this false doctrine. I hope this series helps to confound the false doctrine of many wives and concubines. 
I hope that in my lifetime, Latter-day Saints will lay down our contentions over polygamy and come to a true knowledge of our fathers and God's covenants. I think this will start to happen when we open our hearts to different stories than the ones we've always told ourselves. And from my perspective as a former librarian and lifelong lover of stories, I think this would be fantastic because shoehorning our doctrine of many wives and concubines into the biblical tales has resulted in absolutely terrible stories. If you don't believe me, let's imagine your daughter asks you for a bedtime story and you respond by telling her our version of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca. Once there was a righteous man named Abraham whose wife couldn't have any children. God had promised Abraham that he would be the father of millions upon millions, and he and his wife Sarah couldn't figure out how that was going to work. So God commanded Sarah to tell Abraham to have sex with Sarah's female slave Hagar so that Abraham could have children. This is a special law that God sometimes commands if a man desires to have sex with lots of girls. When this law was revealed to Abraham, it wasn't because he desired to have sex with lots of girls, but because he wanted to be a father, and God blessed Abraham to have a son through Hagar. Unfortunately, Hagar didn't seem to understand that the baby wasn't hers. Hagar was very proud that she was going to be a mother. That made Sarah feel terrible. We know that God had told Sarah to make Hagar have sex with Abraham to fulfill God's promises, but Hagar started acting like her ability to get pregnant meant that she was better than Sarah. Abraham said she could handle the drama herself. Sarah was very firm with her slave and made sure she knew her proper place. Hagar, in turn, was so upset that she ran away. An angel stopped her and told her to go back and submit herself to Sarah, so she did. Hagar had a baby boy which Abraham named Ishmael, and she felt so grateful that the Lord would honor her to give birth to such a righteous man's child. After a few years, Sarah actually gave birth to one of Abraham's sons. Even though she was too old to have children, God promised that she would, and God always fulfills his promises. God told Abraham to name the baby Isaac, and it turned out Isaac was actually the fulfillment of the covenant. Ishmael felt pretty jealous of Isaac and wasn't very nice to him. You know how brothers can be. Sarah told Abraham to send Ishmael and Hagar away, but that made him sad because he loved Ishmael. God promised Abraham that both of his sons would father nations, and Abraham had enough faith to send Ishmael and his mother into the wilderness, and they were scared, but God took care of them. And Ishmael eventually grew up and got married and had a family of his own. Isaac also grew up and married a beautiful woman that he loved. I think it's actually the most romantic love story in scripture, but it's late, so I'll just say that eventually Isaac wanted to have sex with other women, and God justified his desire by giving him many concubines. It may not make sense to you right now, sweetheart, but I promise you that these righteous men and their many wives and concubines are all together in heaven now, and they are all very happy. Good night, angel. Don't forget to have your personal prayer. That's the story of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, if section 132 is God's word. I don't know any Latter-day Saint who would tell their daughter such a story. That's a horror story. And every loving parent would know that it would give their daughter nightmares. Hearing that story would affect the way a daughter saw herself as a future woman. In fact, if that's what being a woman is, maybe she wouldn't want to grow up to be one. A story like that would scar any daughter. But honestly, I hope you can see we have scarred our daughters because we have told them this story in the light of day in church. And so they have had the nightmare haunt them, not just at night, but even in the places where they're commanded to come to have their burdens lifted. This story has accompanied our daughters as they navigate dating and marriage and motherhood and contemplate what it means to be a woman in the plan of salvation. We have to start telling better stories stories that are true. There's something deeply untrue about that story, and it's not because of the way I told it. I didn't twist that story to make it sound worse than it is. That's our factual story of Abraham and Isaac if the entirety of Doctrine and Covenants section 132 is true revelation from God. The best we've been able to do with this story, the very best 
that we can do with all the polygamy stories is not tell them. And when people ask about them, we just say that someday it will all make sense. A few years ago, Richard Bushman, who's the author of Rough Stone Rolling and a faithful Latter-day Saint historian dedicated to transparency, he came under fire for saying that the dominant church narrative is not true, that it can't be sustained. And if you want to know more about that, I'm linking to Dan Peterson's article about it in the show notes. As a fellow Latter-day Saint who also believes in inspiration and divine happenings in angels, plates, translations, and revelations, I agree with Brother Bushman and think our polygamy story is in critical need of a different narrative from biblical polygamy all the way up to, and especially the polygamy and the restoration. Our current narrative is that Joseph Smith asked the Lord how he justified Abraham and Isaac, etc., and their having many wives and concubines, and that only a very select group of individuals knew about this revelation before it was revealed to the saints in Utah in 1852. But eight years earlier, just before Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith were martyred, Hiram was recorded as saying to the Nauvoo City Council that, quote, the revelation which has caused so much talk about a multiplicity of wives, that said revelation was an answer to a question concerning things which transpired in former days and had no reference to the present time. At this same meeting, Joseph was recorded as reading segments of what is now Doctrine and Covenants section 132, and Joseph said of these segments, quote, the truth of God was transformed into a lie, end quote. So there's another way to tell this story. Today, I'm going to tell you a different story about biblical polygamy. I'm going to tell you the story of Abraham and Isaac, if polygamy is an abomination in the sight of God. I'm going to use the information given to us in the Bible and the Pearl of Great Price, because we have an entire book that we believe is written by Abraham. I'll tell you this story, and you can compare it to the one we currently tell ourselves. And then you tell me which one of these two stories sounds like the God who weeps. You tell me which one sounds like the God who says, Come, all ye who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. In a nice bit of numerical symbolism, if you start with Adam and Eve as generation one, we can see that it took seven generations for wickedness to reach full fruition when Lamech, Cain's descendant, became the first to take two wives. And then, of course, that abomination and all others were washed away in Noah's day, when the only people preserved were monogamously married Noah and his three monogamously married sons. So if it took Satan seven generations to institute polygamy, how long do you think it took him to restore it? Well, we don't actually have a record of the first post-flood polygamist, but Abraham, who was born Abram, arrived 11 generations from Noah, after the Tower of Babel, when the people were scattered. When you look at the record from Abram's day, it's easy to see that worldly beliefs about the worth of souls were not in line with what Christians today understand. That's not to say that things had completely gone off the rails as they had in Noah's day. There's strong evidence that around the time of Abraham, humanity had attempted to codify moral rules that would curb abuse, to put up guardrails around the worldly concept that some people are worth more than others. We can find a record of those rules in what's called the Code of Hammurabi. It's the longest, most comprehensive, and best preserved legal text from the ancient Near East. The text is recorded on a stone pillar and was rediscovered in 1901, centuries after being looted. King Hammurabi wrote that he was granted this role by the gods, quote, to prevent the strong from oppressing the weak, end quote. Here are a couple of these laws that I think are interesting when you consider Abram and Sarai's story. Law 144. If a man take a wife and this woman give her husband a maidservant, and she bear him children, but this man wishes to take another wife, this shall not be permitted to him. He shall not take a second wife. Law 146. If a man take a wife, and she give this man a maidservant as wife, and she bear him children, and then this maid assume equality with the wife, because she has borne him children, her master shall not sell her for money, but he may keep her as a slave, reckoning her among the maidservants. In short, Abraham was born into a fallen world, and his is a story of overcoming the world and finding rest. 
Abraham sadly did not get an upbringing like Enoch and Noah, where he was taught how to be a son of God. He does not say he was born of goodly parents like Nephi. He says that his fathers had, quote, turned from their righteousness and from the holy commandments which the Lord their God had given unto them. Their hearts were set to do evil, end quote. Abram knew this wasn't right. He did not accept what he was given as absolute truth, but instead was a seeker. He desired knowledge from God and was a follower of righteousness. Abram's fathers permitted the high priest to attempt to sacrifice him to their false gods, but Abram lifted up his voice to the Lord his God, and the Lord hearkened and heard and delivered him from certain death. We don't have their courtship story, but Abram and Sarai were kin, and after they marry, they get out of this land where there's so much idolatry and wickedness. In fact, the Lord commanded them to leave so that the Lord could make of Abram a great nation. The Lord promises to lead Abram by the hand. Think of how gentle that is. And tells him, as it was with Noah, so shall it be with thee. Just think for a moment about what Noah's family structure looked like. This is inextricable from the priesthood, because monogamous marriage is in the similitude of God, whose image and likeness is a one-to-one ratio of male to female. And as we consider the Lord commanding Abram to leave his homeland, Think about Abraham's descendants in the Book of Mormon that were given the same command. Lehi and Sariah were commanded to leave Jerusalem because of the abominable things that were happening there. They were commanded to leave so that the Lord could raise up a righteous branch who would not hearken to the abominable things which had been done by their fathers. In Abram's day, in Lehi's day, in our day, the Lord wants to raise up seed to himself which means a people who hearken not to whoredoms of old, but rather to the prophecies of all the holy prophets who have prophesied concerning the coming of the Lord, a people who believe that the Lord will redeem his people and have looked forward to that day for a remission of their sins. These are the Lord's seed. So Abraham and Sarah depart, and the Lord gave them assurances that they were on the right path. Due to a great famine in the land, they ended up in Egypt, where Sarai was taken into Pharaoh's house to be a wife slash concubine. The Egypt chapter of Abram's story is very sticky. It's exactly the kind of mess fallen humans get into in a fallen world. The book of Jasher has a version of this story where Pharaoh does not consummate a physical relationship with Sarai. Just about every version of the Bible other than the King James Version, though, does state that Sarai became a wife of Pharaoh. Michelle Stone talks about this Egypt marriage to Pharaoh in her video on Abraham, so if you want to hear more about that, I recommend watching her video, and I'll link it in today's show notes. Since Abraham follows righteousness and was willing to abandon his comfortable life when God commanded him to leave, he doesn't seem to be a man who cares about things over people. I like to think that while Sarai was in Pharaoh's house, Abram focused all his efforts on seeking for God's deliverance. I don't know if he fasted, prayed, said, you led us into this God, you're the only one who can get us out. But whatever Abram and Sarai did on their end, God heard that and really turned the screw on the Egyptians, sending them multiple great plagues. At some point, Pharaoh realized that all this evil that was plaguing his house was because Sarai was actually Abram's wife. As soon as Pharaoh got wise to this, he told Abram, take your wife and go. Abram and Sarai and their extended family left and continued seeking the Lord. The Lord promised Abram that he would make his seed as many as the dust of the earth. Abram and his family continued to have harrowing experiences, but received deliverance from the Lord. Abram was so blessed. God had given him so much, and he wanted to give back to God. Abram found Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God that Abram had sought to follow and Melchizedek administered to Abram that consummate ordinance of the priesthood, the sacrament, and Abram in turn offered tithes. Joseph Smith's translation of this chapter tells us more about Melchizedek and the priesthood, which is, quote, after the order of the covenant which God made with Enoch, end quote. And we remember the covenant God made with Enoch. We then see that Melchizedek blessed Abram, and that Abram offered tithes of all that he had, After these beautiful acts of faith, the Lord came to Abram in a vision 
He showed him the expanse of eternity, and Abram pled for a child of his own. God promised, you will have a literal heir from your own body. Abram also experienced a horror of great darkness as he saw the afflictions his posterity would suffer due to sin. But the Lord promised that they would be delivered. I also think the number of generations is interesting when you consider our Latter-day Saint polygamy. I am the fourth generation from my polygamist ancestors. And this is a common scriptural theme that when people disregard God's voice, there will be blindness until the third or fourth generation. Just something to hopefully give us patience and understanding as we work through this together. Now, Abram's tithe offering was notable because he was so rich. One of the possessions he and Sarai brought out of Egypt was a servant girl named Hagar. The book of Jasher tells us that Hagar was the daughter of one of Pharaoh's concubines, so this would be a biological daughter of Pharaoh. Now, remember the Code of Hammurabi. Sarai and Abram have grown up in a culture where there are laws to protect the weak from the strong, but there is an underlying cultural belief that the weak are still under the authority of the strong. Legally, at this time and in this place, Part of the job description of a female servant was to act as a surrogate mother for the wife of the house if the wife is unable to conceive a child. This idea is so foreign to us today that we've chalked it up to God's higher ways. But do you think that perhaps the reason it's so hard for us to understand is actually because we've been born into a culture that is very much influenced by and even steeped in Christianity? I think it's hard for us to comprehend how significantly Christ's words and works have influenced the world around us. The founding documents of modern nations use the doctrine that all are equal, and that is radically different from Abram and Sarai's day. Abram and Sarai do not live in a world where Christ's words and works are accessible. So I don't think it's surprising that Sarai hearkens to her culture's rules. Abram probably shared his visions and God's promises with her, and she may have thought that she was the reason the promises weren't being fulfilled. Women have that tendency when it comes to childbearing, to think that if something isn't happening or goes wrong, that it's our fault. So this was Sarai's solution. Sadly, like all worldly solutions, Sarai's idea doesn't work very well. Hagar's pregnancy upsets the hierarchy in their home, and it becomes a real mess. The Lord has great love and compassion for everyone in this situation. It would not work out so well for pregnant Hagar if she goes off into the wilderness alone to fend for herself. God shows her what to do to survive, gives her promises of her own, and she feels seen. God sees her situation and will watch over her and help things to work out despite the painful situation that she's been put into. Perhaps God watched waited to see what Abram would do. He had been promised infinite posterity, and at Sarai's encouragement, he had fathered a son with Hagar. Would Sarai encourage him to do it again? Would Abram decide to do it again? Or would they open their eyes to see how bitter the fruit of this worldly choice was? Would they halt their direction and instead choose to wait upon the Lord? For 12 years, God watched. God saw Hagar's pain. God saw Sarai's pain. God saw Abram's pain. God saw how all of that affected Ishmael. And God saw that they did not choose to hearken to worldly solutions again. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. The Lord gave him a new name, Abraham, and Sarai became Sarah. The Lord established his covenant with those two, and those two alone, and their son Isaac was born into this covenant. The covenant is a covenant of monogamy. The reason we know this is that Hagar doesn't have any more children. If Abraham had had more children with Hagar, then we would have to grapple with Abraham being engaged in the work of polygamy after becoming a covenant son of God. But, like with Joseph Smith, There's no posterity other than with his one wife. So you must allow for the possibility, however unlikely you may think it is, you must allow that it is possible that Abraham and Joseph had absolutely zero sexual relations with women other than their one respective wife after entering into covenant with the Lord. 
I urge you to think about Abraham and Sarah's story in light of what President Nelson recently taught in his October 2022 General Conference talk, Overcome the World and Find Rest. Overcoming the world means trusting the doctrine of Christ more than the philosophies of men, such as the Code of Hammurabi, as well-intentioned as it was. It means delighting in truth, denouncing deception, and becoming humble followers of Christ. It means being willing to give away even our favorite sins. Overcoming the world is a process. In an article in the Liahona also in October 2022, President Nelson taught that the bestowal of Abraham and Sarah's new names marked the beginning of a new life and a new destiny for this family. I see that part of their new life, indeed an essential step in overcoming the world, included sending Hagar away, which allowed Sarah and Abraham to attain the oneness of celestial marriage. The Lord had great mercy upon Hagar and Ishmael, who were forced into a lonesome desert existence through social forces and others' choices, and God promised to make Ishmael a great nation. God watched over and delivered Hagar and Ishmael, and they were able to return to their homeland and establish a family there. Sadly, we can see the fruit of Abraham and Sarah's former alliance with the worldly tradition of polygamy in the contention between Ishmael and Isaac's posterity, which has continued for a thousand generations. But we can also see that the new creatures that Abraham and Sarah became diligently taught their son the covenant. For one of the greatest love stories in scripture is that of Isaac and his one and only wife, Rebecca. Isaac knew what covenant marriage was, and he had learned from his parents' story what not to do when infertility struck. When Rebecca was barren, Isaac did not appeal to the code of Hammurabi or whatever the cultural norm of his day said was acceptable. Instead, he entreated the Lord for his wife, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebecca, his wife, conceived. Abraham wrote of incredible visions, and none of them involved anything like polygamy. Hagar isn't even mentioned in the entire book of Abraham, only Sarai. And that's because the book of Abraham teaches us about God, and polygamy does not come from God. After Sarah died and Abraham was a widower, he married a woman named Keturah. Keturah and Abraham had many children, but Keturah was not his covenant wife. Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, was not Abraham's covenant wife. In one spot in Genesis, these women are referred to as concubines, but I would chalk this up to the complexities of language. What do you call women who bore children with a man, one within the law of the land and another as his legal wife after he became a widower, but the women were not his covenant wife? Maybe you call them concubines and move on with the story. And for anyone thinking about this second marriage and worrying about Keturah's eternity, I would quote President Oaks's talk, Trust in the Lord. We can trust in the Lord. Our God is a God of abundance and does not need to indoctrinate abominations into eternity to provide eternal life for any of us. Abraham's story is about being brought out of this fallen world with its disastrous methods for problem solving and into God's presence where we can find true rest. It's about the redemptive power of Jesus Christ to heal us from the injustice and iniquities of this world. Trying to shoehorn the doctrine of many wives and concubines into Abraham and Isaac's story, as if it comes from God rather than its true author, Satan, results in a doctrinally schizophrenic horror story. I'm not saying God isn't in the polygamy document. I think God's voice is there, but not in the way that we were taught. God wants us to see, look, Isaac wasn't a polygamist. He didn't receive concubines. Look at the first verse. It tells us that the entire document comes from the perspective of someone who believes Isaac was. And this person also believes men can be justified in having many wives and concubines. Polygamy in this document is framed as an Abrahamic sacrifice. If it was anything for the Latter-day Saints, they testified that they saw it this way. And the defining feature of an Abrahamic sacrifice is that it ends. It does not perpetuate for eternity. Look, if we are to go and do the works of Abraham, 
Then we will, like Abraham, cast polygamy into the desert wilderness and leave it to the mercy of its creator. Thank you for watching and for being willing to consider a different version of Abraham and Isaac's story than the one that we've told ourselves for the last few generations. I believe that God is calling out to us to see these stories as they really are and to start telling them truthfully. Next time, we'll talk about Jacob and his brother Esau, who should have received the covenant but broke it by marrying, shocker, two wives. As always, contemplating polygamy in this way leads to a lot of questions, but I hope you will always prioritize the most important one. Is polygamy wheat or is it a tear? It cannot be both.